Passionate, driven, enthusiastic, euphoric. This is who we are as entrepreneurs, but how we leverage these incredible attributes to dream and build businesses that scale and grow is what this podcast is all about. Hello, I'm attorneypreneur Josh Brown, and welcome to Franchise Euphoria. Hello, welcome back to another episode of Franchise Euphoria. Today, I'm thrilled to have on Matt Miller. Matt spent the first nine years of his career as an Air Force pilot before entering the private sector to work in both the medical device and advertising industries. While a top performer in the corporate world, his long-term desire was to be his own boss. A good friend one day mentioned the gumball machines he and his young daughters owned and that conversation began a 10-year business quest that has brought Matt's company, School Spirit Vending, to the cutting edge of both the vending and school fundraising industries. Today, School Spirit Vending's franchising program provides a proven and profitable business system for busy professionals and their families looking to develop secondary income streams with a limited time commitment. Hello, Matt. Welcome to the show. Hey, Josh. Good to be here. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. You know, I'm really excited to speak with you because first of all, I love, I love, um, what you're doing in the franchise space, but it's, it's fascinating to me with school spirit vending. Um, I don't really know much about it, so I'm excited to hear about it, but it seems like it's got a dual purpose, which I love. And it's got a very, um, a very social conscious, uh, purpose. And so I really, really love that aspect about it. But before we dive into that, um, maybe to add on to the introduction, tell us a little little bit about school spirit vending, how you got the idea and then how you developed it into sort of a franchise model. I got started in vending Josh about 10 years ago. Um, uh, had a bunch of stuff happen corporately with my job that impacted my family's income in a big way and saw the writing on the wall and the fact that the corporate gig was not going to get me where I needed to go financially and kind of get me out of the hole that I was in after coming out of the military. So started to do some things on the side. I sold books online through Amazon and Alibris and half.com for a while. My son and I collected aluminum cans. Um, I did some multi-level marketing, did a number of different things. The challenge with all those things was I had read Robert Kiyosaki's book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, a couple of years before. So I measured every single one of those businesses against what Kiyosaki talked about in relation to passive income. And in every one, I was just creating another job for myself. So I was continuing to look. I had a good buddy of mine from church mentioned that he and his daughters had bought some gumball machines. And it was a way that they could do something together. He was teaching them about business. They were making some money. And I remember that conversation. So I decided to get started in the bulk vending world, initially with candy and gumballs, eventually moving into toys and temporary tattoos and stickers and that type of thing. So wait, well, let me let me stop you right there. So when you when you make that decision to get involved in in the in the vending world, what were the next steps that you did to sort of research that? I think it's important for the audience. I mean, there's a lot of people uh, listening in who who have all sorts of ideas and thoughts and visions and dreams of what they what they want to do, but so often that's where it starts and stops. And obviously, you're different, and you've been able to take your vision and turn it into a business. But what was the first step that you did after you formulated this idea? You know, I did a bunch of research. I, I read, man, probably four or five books, most of them ebooks off of Amazon, talking about vending. Decided that bulk, which was, you know, the toys and the candy and all that, was the best place for me. Number one, the machines were easy to operate. There was no electricity or circuit boards or anything involved. They're also very, very inexpensive. But most importantly, the capacity of the machines was very, very large, meaning the equipment didn't need to be seen that often. So I could go 30, 60 days in most cases, set the machine up, let it do its thing. I go back to doing my full time job successfully. And but on the side, there's money that's being created um, at with quarters being put in those machines all across the Houston area at that point in time. Um <clears throat> You know, I, I looked into, I got with this, the uh, the state comptroller's office, found out about sales tax, that type of thing in, in my state. Um, I got with a local bank uh, that 
could handle my needs, that being, you know, large volumes of quarters and, and, and slowly and systematically put those things together. I got a DBA. Um, yeah, I, we ended up getting an LLC later on once we transitioned to the, to the fundraising side of things with SSV, but just a lot of the basic business stuff, which quite honestly, you know, several years before was kind of scary to me because it was an unknown today. It's just like, Oh, okay. I got to go get a DBA. Oh, I got to do this. I got to do that. But I, I know that there's a lot of people out there that even those little things are holding them back because they seem so such insurmountable tasks just because they're, they're different and they're not used to them. So did you start this while you were working at another job is what. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I put this thing together, uh, man for 10 or excuse me, five, six years on, on the side. In fact, there was one point in time here about five years ago where I was working full time. I was delivering pizzas for pizza hut at night because I needed more seed capital for my business. Wow. And I was putting, you know, SSV together. Um, I was burning the candle at both ends, but I had to do what I had to do given my situation and knew that being that busy was not going to be that case always just for a season in my life. Well, so take a minute to explain for those that don't know and 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 for myself as well. Tell me the the underlying business model for school spirit vending. What is it that that you do? Well, what happened was I had four young kids come knocking on my door, selling me stuff for their local schools. I didn't know the kids, their parents weren't with them. And I thought that was really odd that here they were essentially being door to door salespeople for the local school. So I wondered if there was a way I could tie vending into what they were doing and maybe get some kids off the street. So what we did is with my print media background, because I was in the advertising space for 11 years, I figured out a way to custom design school spirit stickers for the schools. Initially, my thoughts were for the high school and junior high kids for athletic events, you know, temporary tattoos, that type of thing. But what we found out is the older kids didn't interact with the machine, but the younger ones did. So we pivoted and most of our work is done with the younger kids today. But what we do is we custom design stickers for schools. We customize a machine that goes in that school for them. So it fits right in with, with everything else they've got in the building. And then we put those custom stickers in the machine and then whatever else the kids are into as well. It ends up being an ongoing passive fundraiser for the school. And it ends up being a passive income stream for our franchisees. You know, that's so fascinating. Is there another vending company doing what you're doing? Because I've worked with several of them. And obviously the, the, the traditional type of vending model is food based, but yours is school spirit based. And I think it's really, really interesting. You know, we've got some small operators here and there that dabble a little bit in, in our space. But, but to be honest, we put so much extra time, energy, effort and investment in to making this be something special for the school that t- uh, to date anyway, I haven't found anybody willing to, to go to that length to do business in the space that we are. So now, now you mentioned you you found better success with some of the younger kids. What, what kind of age group or schools, uh, school range do you, do you look for? It, t- uh, primarily elementary schools. So up, yeah, probably up through what, probably up through sixth grade. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's perfect. Well, you know, it's interesting, Matt, talking with you because, you know, I've taken some notes down and, and jotted that, you know, you've, you've, one of the things I really appreciate and I think is a good lesson for a lot of people out there is um, you've taken a lot of your past experiences and things that you've, you've, um, you've gained sort of knowledge and experience from, i.e. your print media background, your multi, your marketing background, um, the discipline you gained from, from your military experience. And now you've turned that in and utilized those skills to now create a, a profitable and growing business. And, and I think that's really instructive because I think a lot of people are searching for that right idea or for that right concept when in reality, you know, a lot of times we just need to look back at our own experiences and to figure out what those synergies are and those can align well to, to be the basis for a business going forward. Yeah, I, I've always heard it said that success is when opportunity and preparedness meet. And I didn't know that God was putting me in the place that he was putting me to teach me 
advertising and printing and all those things. I could have never fathomed that, but you're right. I've, I've um, found things that I've got knowledge in, in, and then we found um, niches that have a real need and just built on those. And it, it's exciting what's going on. I, I'm excited about the team we've got coming together. You know, there's a bunch of people out there, like you mentioned earlier, that, that want to do something for themselves, but they don't really know how. And in many cases, a business like ours or the thousands of franchises out there um, may very well be the best fit for them because they don't have to figure it out. They just have to be willing to duplicate a proven system um, to their own success instead. So how many franchisees do you currently have? We officially have 13. We we started out with a distributor model because we've been doing this for eight years. Okay. So I've got about 55 families that we work with. Um the majority of them are in the process of transitioning over to being franchisees. Uh, but we have started actually, you know, franchising directly uh, above and beyond those folks as well. By the end of this calendar year, we'll have 40 plus franchisees and um, have a whole herd of new folks that are we're in talk talking with right now that, that look pretty promising to, to qualify and, and to get started with us here going into the new year. Now you had mentioned you started in, in Houston. Are, are you outside of Texas at this point or, or what number of states are you in? Yeah, we're in about 26 states right now um, in a couple thousand schools. Wow. That's tremendous. It's, it's interesting because, um, you know, a, a lot of people that, that I end up speaking with try to, with this kind of a model, try to start with a distributorship, just a straight distributorship, and then eventually do switch over to franchising. What was the impetus for you to make that decision and that sort of pivot into the franchise model? The biggest thing that I found was that I wanted to systematize this thing more so than the distributorship model would really allow. And in a lot of states, Josh, as you know, especially in the Northeast um, and out West, uh, there's a lot more strict and stringent guidelines on the state level to where registration of businesses is required and that type of thing. And I just realized if we wanted to grow um, to our fullest potential here in the U.S., we really needed to be a franchise so that we could register in those states and do business, you know, following the rules and guidelines that they have established for businesses within those states. So now do you have a team that's helping you go out and market the business or are you out there promoting it and trying to, in other words, how are you finding your current and, and, and future franchisees? You know, this is going to sound probably a little bit crazy, but right now these podcast interviews are our main source of marketing. Um, we have plans. I've been talking with a number of different marketing companies that specialize in brokers that specialize in, in the franchise side of things. And in going into next year, we will start working with some of them. But here's what I found. And here's what is so powerful about interviews like this is the fact that when people reach out to us, they already feel like they know about us. They feel like they know me. There's already a relationship built there because they've listened to me. They've had a chance to hear a conversation like we're having now. So in many cases, people are already pre-qualified by the time they reach out versus just, just somebody through a search engine or whatever, you know, doing a search and, and coming across our website. There's a whole new level of education that has to occur on the front end for them to kind of get up to speed. Um, with what I'm doing so far, they are they already have a pretty good idea what we do and how we do it. No, I could not agree more. I mean, you. I think you and I share a mutual friend in, uh, well, probably several mutual friends, but Tom Schwab being yep. one of them. And he's got a whole uh, business model where he goes and helps people um, become good podcast guests um, as a business development mechanism. And I think it's, I think you're exactly right. I mean, I know for myself, when I started this podcast two and a half years ago, I just did it because I thought it'd be fun and cool and, you know, something different. And I can't tell you the number of calls I've gotten from people from different states who, 
are ready to hire me. And when I go to tell them about myself, they'll say, oh, I already know all about you. I listen to the podcast. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, yeah. well, I, I had done Tom's or I had done probably 20 interviews or so. And then I came across Tom and his course. I took his course and it completely changed everything because it showed me how to capture that interest in the audience and, and to begin, um, a dialogue with those people. Whereas before it was just, Hey, if you want to talk, shoot me an email type thing. And so that has been a huge, huge thing for us is me coming across Tom and, and, and learning, you know, all that he has to share in that course. Well, that's great. No, Tom's a great guy. And I know he's doing, uh, doing great things, uh, with that course. I'm going to actually have him back on to, to talk about that, uh, again on the podcast. Cause I think it's beneficial for a lot of people. I really, you know, one of the things I've learned in franchising is especially for the starter franchisors who obviously you've been doing this for a number of years, but there's a number of entrepreneurs who are just turning their business, um, into a franchise or starting down that road. And, you know, there's a lot of bro out there, there's a lot of third party vendors that will happily take your money and a lot of it to try to market yourself and, and get you out there to the public. But what I have found time and time again is is that slow and steady wins the race. Um, I think the numbers prove that out. I think if you look at the vast majority of successful franchises, they have grown more organically as opposed to, you know, let's open up 200 stores over the next or 200 locations over the next year or two. I mean, I, I really am a big believer in you need to dominate your local area market and then expand out from there. And I think going on podcast interviews and doing those really intentional type interviews where you can talk about your business and reach an audience that's going to be an audience that's, that's going to take it in um, uh, in a good fashion is really the way to go. So good for you for doing that. Well, yeah. And, and what does it take? It takes my time, right? Um, I, I've talked with several of those f firms like you talk about, and here's the challenge. My, my goal is not to create a bunch of wealth for myself with the franchise fees. So, but that being said, you know, some of the, some of the amounts of money that these companies are commanding to bring in leads and, and qualified candidates and all that is, is pretty pretty crazy to where, um, for me to actually begin to work with some of them, I'm actually going to have to increase my fees just to be able to afford to pay for that marketing. And I'm, I'm not prepared to do that right now. I, you know, we're very low cost in, in the whole franchise game, um, for a reason, because I want there to be a low barrier to entry to folks. Um, because, I started with a very low barrier of entry years ago and I've seen what vending to begin with. And now SSV has done for me and my family and I want to make it accessible. And of course, every time those fees go up, you're limiting the number of people that can potentially get involved and, and thrive in a system like we have. So that's kind of a quandary that I'm sure every franchisor deals with um, that we're wrestling with right now. But that's also another reason why I'm, I'm so much of my focus is here versus with some of those other things. Well, I mean, you want to grow. Obviously, every business wants to grow. And I, and, and there's maybe a time and place for those uh, third party uh, brokers. But, yeah, I think you're doing it the right way, especially as you're as you're uh, getting going and and um, and fine tuning and, and, and going through the expansion um, part. And it sounds like you've already got a a ton of interest. So now it's a matter, it seems to me, of, of you making sure that you're getting the right people interested and, and attracting the right people. And I think tying into that, what wh who is the right franchisee for school spirit vending, if you had to describe them? You know, in most cases, it's somebody who is already wildly successful in their career, but they're not satisfied. They realize that They've got all their eggs in one basket and want to spread that out, that risk out. They want to diversify their income streams, not just their, you know, investment portfolio. Um, in many cases, one of the things that folks are attracted to our business by is the fact that we've got a huge focus on the family and family involvement in business 
Um, in fact, one of our mantras is family is our foundation. My kids were involved in my business from day one, helping collate stickers, helping put machines together, you name it. My oldest two today are graphic designers because of our business and, uh, and support us and, and make a, a, a good, you know, side income as students in support of us. But then we've got a lot of folks on our team that have, you know, their kids involved as well. And now we've got the second generation getting involved because they helped mom and dad when they were in their teens, they, they came of age 18 or older, decided that they want to pursue for themselves, what mom and dad were pursuing and now they've gone out and started their own businesses as well. And it is just, it's a real kick for me to see that. We have an annual, what we call conclave in June every year, where we bring everybody together and we, we conduct some business because that's why we're there. But we encourage folks to bring their families and we spend a lot of the weekend just creating memories. And all of our kids now have gotten to you know, accustomed to and and excited about getting a chance to see their friends every year as they all kind of grow up together in this community that we've created. That's tremendous. I mean, bringing business and family together, they certainly don't have to be uh, in opposition to one another. So that <laughs> that's that's certainly tremendous. Um, tell me if somebody is interested in in learning more about the franchise or just interested in the concept and wants to reach out to you. What is the best way to get a hold of you? Well, my email, Josh, is matt at ssvbusiness.com. And what I'd love to do for anybody in your audience that's interested, I've got a, a free ebook. It's it's real short. It's just three or four pages. It's called Live Your Dreams, The Top 10 Reasons Why You Need to Start a Vending Business. And if they go to ssvbusiness.com forward slash euphoria, they can get uh, that, download it for free, and we can at least start a dialogue from there. Tremendous. Well, thank you for thank you for that. And thank you for your time and, and coming on here. And it really, you know, I deal with a lot of I, on a daily basis. I, I see a lot of franchises and truly um, I really, really appreciate um, what you're trying to do uh, with School Spirit Venting. And it seems like you're off to, to a tremendous start. So thank you for taking the time uh, out of your schedule and coming on. And I look forward to staying in touch with you. Hopefully this was helpful for you today. If you are in the market for a franchise, I would highly encourage you to check out my free ebook, which is what to know before you buy a franchise. You can head over to my website at indie, that's I-N-D-Y franchiselaw.com and download it there for free. And um, let me know what you think. If you're enjoying this podcast, if you're enjoying the value that you're getting from this podcast, I'd also invite you to go to iTunes and Uh, Provide me with a rating and review. It always helps uh, for visibility on the podcast. So thank you so much for your support and uh, hope this episode was helpful to you. Thanks for being with us today on the Franchise Euphoria podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to go to iTunes and provide a review. Also, please remember that although Josh Brown is a licensed and practicing attorney, nothing contained in this podcast should be construed as legal advice, because it is not. The information contained in this podcast is general and educational in nature, and none of it should be relied upon as legal advice. That being said, if you have questions for Josh and would like to contact him, please email him at josh at franchiseuphoria.com. Thank you so much for listening, and we hope you tune in to our next weekly episode.